morning. I'm Mike Albertson. I'm the deputy director here at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Margarita Kanaev, who is deputy director of analysis and a research fellow at Georgetown Center for Emerging Center for Security and Emerging Technology. She said, "I got that confused with my own my own center's name." Uh, her CGSR lecture this morning is titled Russia's AI Innovation Trajectory and Uncertain Future. Let me tee up her presentation with a few words to help set the scene here for the audience. So I was listening to a, a roundtable discussion yesterday on military adaptation, and one of the panelists made the remark that, quote, technology does not equal capability, unquote, which boiled down you know, having the thing doesn't mean you can use the thing effectively in terms of technology. And I thought Rita's presentation abstract on the subject of, of Russia and artificial intelligence really highlighted this disconnect well. So I thought that was an interesting note to start on today. Um, you know, we're very focused here at the lab in advanced technology uh, and technology competition and the impact of artificial intelligence comes up quite frequently in these discussions. But a common theme in, in our CGSR workshops and events is that, you know, understanding the dynamics of technology competition is very difficult. Uh, how do you measure uh, the positive and negative effects of disruptive technology? How do you assess whether you're ahead or behind in a technology competition? And how do you assess whether being ahead or behind in that competition matters and in what way? You look at the Russians, and, and as Rita will note, they talk a lot about AI. They talk a lot about the need for advanced technology. They talk a lot about sort of the game-changing effects of advanced technology. But understanding how Russian government pronouncement doesn't necessarily lead to concrete policy results, how money spent in the defense budget doesn't necessarily equal systems developed, and as we've seen in, in Ukraine, how technologies don't necessarily translate into ba battlefield capabilities and military effectiveness. So any substantive analysis of Russian capabilities has to look both at the positives and the negatives. And I'm really looking forward to this presentation today, which does exactly that on this interesting topic of, of AI. So let me say a little bit about the speaker. Uh, Dr. Margarita Kanaev is, is, as I said, the, the Deputy Director of Analysis and a Research Fellow at, at Georgetown CSET. Uh, she's interested in the military applications of AI and Russian military innovation, her talk today. Uh, she's also an adjunct senior fellow with the Center for New American Security. Uh, her research on international security, armed conflict, non-state actors, and, and urban warfare in the Middle East, Russia, and Eurasia has been published extensively in places like, like the Journal of Strategic Studies, Journal of Global Security Studies, Conflict Management and Peace Studies, the French Institute of International Relations, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Lawfare, War on the Rocks, Modern War Institute, Foreign Policy Research Institute, and a range of other outlets. So just about any place you would read on sort of military innovation and culture, you know, she, she's published there. Uh, ground rules for the talk today, uh, Rita's going to deliver her remarks for about 30 to 45 minutes, go through her slides, and at that point we'll open the floor for discussion. Uh, please get your hand up electronically. Please submit your questions to me in the chat function so we can get the discussion rolling quickly. Um, once her remarks conclude and try to get as many of your questions and comments in in the time allotted. There's a lot of people out there tuning in. I hope the discussion will be lively, so get your questions early and your hands up. Um, Rita, thank you again for being with us and, and over to you for your presentation. Thank you so much, Michael, for this kind introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I will start by, first of all, apologizing for the guest appearances my dogs might make while I'm talking about this very serious topic. We might enjoy some comic relief by two very comical uh, French bulldogs. Um, so my apologies for that in advance. Uh, um, today's topic, I think Michael did a really good you know, summary of Many of my bottom lines and my kind of main takeaways over the last six months, this real understanding of not only how we assess and approach the technological competition or the idea of innovation versus adoption, but also how we write about it when it pertains to Russia, but also when it pertains to China and even to ourselves is really at a place where it's ready for some reflection and perhaps hopefully some real changes because 
our efforts to try to understand what our competitors and enemies are doing um, at times are not as accurate as they could be. Um, and I'm talking about very much, you know, a community that includes myself and my own work. Um, and again, at a point of self-reflection of trying to understand what are the best ways to write about this topic as accurately and possible as possible, given obviously the limitations of the sources, the propensity of these governments to exaggerate, um, and uh, at the same time, um, a reluctance to underestimate some of the threats that we are facing and some of the technological accomplishments that our competitors are seeing. So with that in mind, I kind of want to pre uh, preview this by saying that the talk itself, you will see, uh, inevitably kind of verificates itself to before the war and after the war. So if you find yourself for the first 15 minutes wondering, well, this seems completely, you know, far-fetched and unrealistic, um, I don't disagree with you, but I urge you to um, kind of exercise a little bit of patience because in the end of the conversation, you know, in the end of the presentation, I will absolutely get to a discussion about what we used to think about six months ago and how we are reassessing some of these um, assessments. All right, so I will get started here. Um, and if you've been following anything about Russian AI, even at the most you know rudimentary level of watching what are the key statements that are coming out of Russia on artificial intelligence, since 2017, probably the most um, super quotable and popular statement coming out of Russia was a quote from Putin who stated that whoever becomes the leader in artificial intelligence is going to rule the world and that Russia was very much in the running there. So here you see a chance meeting between uh, the Russian president, Putin, and Promobot, who was uh, a very exciting uh, business robot development that allegedly had, uh, you know, facial recognition capabilities. And as Putin was walking by, um, recognized Putin and greeted him and engaged him in conversation. So that was a fun little interaction from a couple of years ago. Uh, that was, you know, promoted as a perception or an insight into Russia's many um, advances in this space. And then here you kind of have the contrast of expectations versus reality on Russian emerging technologies. And this is a title from uh, the New York Times article from May saying that sanctions are forcing Russia to use parts in military gear that are coming from washing machines because of, you know, uh, the lack of these, uh, these parts uh, domestically in Russia and the sanctions that have, you know, implicated Russia's supply chains. So this interesting contrast between what Russia thought uh, it was or at least what Russia was signaling that it was achieving and promoting versus what is happening in reality uh, in many ways gets to what um, we started with, this importance of differentiating what we see and how we talk, to, talk about it, um, kind of differentiating those expectations versus reality. So keeping that in mind throughout the conversation. What I wanna to do today is to do a very brief overview of research and commercial developments in artificial intelligence in Russia to show you some of the findings from work that we've done here at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology on Russian AI. I then wanna connect that to military, military issues and how Russia thinks about leveraging AI um, and related technology for military accomplishments, military dominance, what are the areas where it's investing, and how to an extent it reflects its understanding of modern warfare, um, or once again, what we thought it does based on doctrinal abuse. And finally, I want to kind of summarize some of the uh, 
initial and um, circumspect insights from the war in Ukraine and what we might be seeing about the future trajectory of Russian AI developments, which to an extent are justifiably, I think some experts are assessing to be bleak. Um, again, if you're using parts from washing machines into your advanced military systems, then you're clearly in trouble. At the same time, I think that there are other aspects that we have to consider about, you know, the duration of these sanctions, ways to overcome them and evade them, and the other types of partnerships that Russia has with countries outside of the West. And I'm not only talking about China, which I will speak to, but also countries like India, Israel, and now Iran we're seeing as well as North Korea. So all of these all of these issues we'll touch upon today. And most of all, I'm hoping to keep my remarks to about 30, 35 minutes and then um, have a conversation with you and answer your questions and engage. All right, then let's get started. In 2019, the Russian government released a strategy for artificial intelligence, kind of a guiding document that is meant to direct the government uh, to its various bodies uh, towards understanding the critical areas for AI investment, AI development, research and development that was related to AI, um, the role universities are going to play, the role that uh, state-owned corporations, state-owned enterprises are going to play, uh, a general, you know, a relatively pretty uh, developed and advanced uh, strategic document. If you're interested in reading it uh, in English on our website, on the CSET website, we did a translation with some commentary that I did kind of highlighting some of the high level points there. And in it, as a prelude to the document itself, there was a statement that said that the Russian government fully believes that the country could very much become a leader in artificial intelligence. And to a real extent, that belief is grounded in some justifiable assumptions and developments. Uh, one of the key ones being the fact that Russia still remains among the top 10 countries in terms of its investments in research and development overall. There is also a tradition and one that has remained to some extent since the days of the Soviet Union about high quality STEM education uh, up to the university levels and including so. We've also seen really interesting and quite sophisticated advances in the commercial sector, specifically in areas such as facial and speech recognition technologies, startups that have become internationally competitive and gained a lot of investment and attention from uh, you know, the rest of the world, including the United States. And we also seen some, you know, cool applications when it comes to AI for finance and banking spearheaded by Sparebank, which is Russia's top, um, you know, financial institution and also one of the leaders for AI implementation. So in this commercial space and this R&D space, Russia did have some, let's say, sufficient bona fides to make the argument that it could become one of the countries that makes important advances in AI. Having said that, there's absolutely no argument that Russia is significantly behind the United States and China in all of the key parameters that we use to judge and to assess and estimate uh, progress uh, towards artificial intelligence. So when it comes to investment, both government investment, but especially private investment, in the United States and China, we're talking about billions and billions, while in Russia, where it's, again, hard to estimate, but it's nowhere near. It's probably very much still in the lower millions. Um, this point on the lack of private investment is quite critical because generally all of science and technology research, all of science, scientific research in Russia, 70% of it is funded by the state. That's very different from how it is in the United States. So there is really a, not a very sophisticated investment, commercial investment, private investment ecosystem in Russia too, that we know has been behind some of the massive advances in AI in recent years. Russia is also behind in, you know, in chips and supercomputing capabilities, all the hardware that we know that AI runs on. Um, 
everything that is pertains to data management from collection to storage analysis, um, not nowhere near the United States and China. And finally, and quite critically, the question of talent. Uh, and we've been, I'm sure you've been hearing about the issue of brain drain in the context of the war in Ukraine. You must have previously heard about it in the context of the Soviet Union scientists, but it's a problem that Russia has always had a major problem with, uh, you know, a major issue with because of a variety of issues, including the inability to provide competitive salaries, the um, life quality, um, the tendency to start wars with its neighbors, a, a whole range of reasons that don't make it attractive to people who can be internationally competitive and move and work elsewhere. So all of these parameters really put Russia significantly behind the United States and China when it comes to AI. And I want to give you a bit of an example to really how much are we talking about here and at least one of the parameters. We published, we did a report at CSAT that uh, looked into Russian AI research output. This is in English language between the years 2010 and 2018. And we did a comparison that looked into where does Russia stand vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States and China. And what you see here is really striking. You see that uh, China and the United States as a whole over those eight years that we looked to produced over 250,000 papers, while co papers coming out of Russia didn't even cross the 10,000 mark. And I know you might be thinking, well, you looked at English language production, that might be uh, causing a disadvantage in what we're counting in terms of Russian research uh, in the Russian language, but we did a pretty comprehensive search of articles published in Russian and we found very little. Uh, also, you know, take into consideration that the most competitive research is done in English. So in areas, you know, the, these ratios are really quite staggering. For instance, American researchers outperform Russian researchers 42 to 1 in areas like computer vision, for instance, and 58 to 1 in machine learning. So across the subfields and overall production, no argument here. It should really demonstrate, you know, bring the point home about how much Russia has been lagging behind in terms of AI research production. Having said that, it was also interesting to us to kind of, you know, understanding that Russia is behind uh, China and the United States in terms of overall production. We still wanted to take a closer look into what are the primary areas of AI research that Russian scientists uh, and researchers were in fact exploring just to understand these relatives area of emphasis that are of interest. And we saw that nearly half of Russian AI research papers were concentrated in, in fields like computer vision, pattern recognition, linguistics, NLP, the study of algorithms, and importantly robotics. And considering the fact that much of the science, like I said, more than 70% of scientific and technological research in Russia is funded by the state, and the relationship between states and universities and states and research institutions is very, is very close, it's perhaps not very surprising that some of these areas in science, uh, in scientific research, reflect some of the commercial and governmental interests that Russia has. So the commercial interests really mirror the focus that the Russian, uh, you know, private uh, ecosystem has been focusing on, like what I mentioned earlier, the facial and speech recognition technologies, which inevitably reflect the government interest in things like internet and media control and monitoring. These advances went hand in hand with some of the laws and legal uh, frameworks that the Russian government has been implementing to really restri restrict the freedom of speech, the freedom of information, freedom to you know navigate the information online. Um, we know that Moscow, for instance, uh, as part of its smart city technology development, is working on some of the largest domestic surveillance infrastructure in the world. 
So this is to say that these areas of research very much correspond to what's happening in the commercial sector and is being led by government interest in these areas. And for the defense sector, this interest in robotic is particularly clear, um, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, that very much aligns with where Russia has been, where the Russian defense um, organizations have been investing their attention and money. So let's kind of shift gears here, building on that alignment between where the research is, how it fits into government interests, and how, especially in this area of robotics, it once again aligns with what the Ministry of Defense and the broader defense ecosystem in Russia have been interested in working on. And I'll start here by saying that over the past five to seven, you know, six, seven years, the Russian Ministry of Defense has really established and developed this network of research and development organizations that are focused on emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, autonomy, a variety of cyber capabilities. So it's really been expanding its emphasis on R&D for emerging tech, for sure. And one thing to be clear about, uh, because if you follow the technological parameters of some of these innovations, you you know, might not be particularly impressed, especially considering the sophisticated and futuristic and incredible accomplishments we see out of the United States and China. I want to be clear that that is to extend, um, to some extent, is by design, because the approach that Russia has to innovation, and more in within that to artificial intelligence and related technologies, is not revolutionary. Rather, there are interested much more in evolutionary progress and these gradual incremental assessments and changes and uh, kind of building on one another and not hoping and not even attempting to uh, leapfrog or um, outdo or outcompete. It comes from an understanding that the symmetries and weaknesses that Russia has very much reflected and continue to exist in its tech space, including its military technology. So when it comes to advanced and emerging technologies, again, the approach is not to completely revolutionize the field, but to evolve it um, through this evolutionary approach. And we've seen over the last decade or even more since the big push towards military modernization in Russia since, let's say, 20, um, 20, 2008 or so, after the war with Georgia, really, uh, a real emphasis on uh, areas like military robotics and unmanned systems with a range of, you know, remotely operated, semi-autonomous to experimentation with even fully autonomous capabilities for unmanned systems that are used for the mining, uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, military resupply, medical evacuation, as well as in combat support roles and fire support roles. There is also a big push to invest and develop low-cost drones that may one day work in this format of an autonomous wingman for human pilots. And I'm sure that, you know, that rings the bell for some of the efforts that the U.S. military is pursuing. Here it's reflected, you know, Russia has similar programs to that as well, with this idea of autonomous pilots. Uh, there's some work, you know, that also looked into some swarming technology in this space as well, although a lot of it's quite rudimentary. Another area where the Russian, you know, military experts have talked about AI making a real big difference is electronic warfare. And Russia has become a world leader, or at least, again, based to some of the assessments that we've had uh, based on Russian military investments and its demonstrations of certain capabilities, Russia has seem to be one of the world leaders over the past few years in this area of uh, electronic warfare. And it seemed that it was now focusing on using autonomous and AI-enabled technologies to push that advantage even farther with different applications for reconnaissance, jamming, 
enemy communications, and even testing these capabilities in support of air and missile defense systems in countering drones, uh, which if you followed the recent conflict, including the Corn of Warbach, even previously, um, but very much so in Ukraine has been um, a major development in modern warfare is how to deal with drones. So electronic warfare is definitely an area for emphasis. And finally, um, an area that is very difficult to track because perhaps it's most clandestine of all is the area of information operations. But we definitely know that Russia puts a massive emphasis on the information environment and how to shape and use and manipulate the information environment. And for Russia, the concept of cyber warfare is subsumed under the idea of information operations. So there is a conversation, there is an understanding that AI can use, uh, can play a major role, promising to increase the speed, the reach, the precision, the scale and impact of various influence operations, the spread of misinformation, disinformation, the impact of cyber attacks, and all other forms of information warfare that Russia has developed and you know, refined and perfected over the years. So these are, of course, there's many other areas that we've been tracking, um, you know, those of us who study Russian technology, Russian military technology, such as command and control, um, like I said, some some things in missile defense. Uh, there, There's, across the board, you did see a very intensive amount of conversations and writing and uh, reports of investments that were focused on uh, leveraging artificial intelligence and autonomy for, uh, you know, future conflicts. And with that, I want to say that, of course, the technology itself, at least it's interesting, but what is perhaps even more impactful is understanding how the technology fits into an understanding of modern warfare or what we can think about as the Russian way of war, at least based on doctrine at writing. So it's how this technology could be employed and how do these investments fit into the broader, you know, Russian way of war. And here the emphasis on, you know, using um, unmanned systems to moderate the manpower and resources demand of modern warfare is one that resonates, I'm sure, also across US, US conversations on this topic, because that's the primary emphasis to a great extent in investment in these systems. It's an understanding that you know, you want to safeguard your military personnel and you want to reduce the pressures on them and military, you know, AI autonomy can play a major, major role here. What is perhaps more specific to the way that Russia, at least, at least Russian doctrine, has been focusing on leveraging AI is really this emphasis on military investments that are meant to establish control of the information environment, and particularly during this early period of war. And that's in large part because, at least once again, based on the writing and conversations that we've been tracking, the Russians have learned the hard way from Chechnya and Georgia and previously in Ukraine as well about the importance of controlling the information environment. And they now increasingly see that AI can be used and help with that mission set, including to deploy some of these tools much earlier before any sort of facility start to kind of prep the ground. Um, again, with this emphasis that a lot can be accomplished in this early period of war. And while most of the technologies that I, you know, discussed on the previous slide for the military robotics, electronic warfare, and even uh, how AI can play a role in the information environment, it really is still under development and testing stages. Even when we were, you know, assessing what are sort of investments that are happening before we were studying the war in Ukraine right now, it was pretty clear that a lot of it is just pretty early on as opposed to has been adopted across the board. What was really notable about Russia, and I think to 
still a great, to some extent, stands and differentiates it from the United States, let alone China, is that Russia has been generally much faster to field and to test, to field test these new weapons and new technologies and these uh, modernized technologies that it's been working on. So especially in Syria, we've heard a lot about Syria essentially becoming a testing ground, a laboratory for Russian military innovation and modernization with more than 200 modern systems and weapons have been tested in Ukraine. And this is a really critical point because we know, and particularly with AI, that the way that AI performs in set and expected and constrained conditions versus the vulnerabilities and the challenges that it faces when it's deployed in you know, uh, fluid environments and new environments, let alone uh, you know, in operational settings, are, there's a huge difference there. So the fact that, you know, Russians were quick to test a lot of these systems, I'm not saying that the majority of them were AI related by any means, but generally new technologies tested in, in operational settings, that's, that's, an important, that's an important kind of an advantage when it comes to knowing what these systems can do, but equally important knowing what these systems cannot do. And then learning how to evolve concepts of operation in response to integrating these future technologies, if if they are thinking of integrating them into the future. Um, all right, like I said, that there, there's going to be a bit of a transition in terms of how we tracked and thought about Russian investments and in military AI and AI in general and emerging technologies and Russian military technologies capabilities writ large to what we have learned based on the, let's say generously, the abysmal performance of the Russian military, especially during the early stages of the war in Ukraine. And we've definitely seen some adaptation and some improvement in military performance and uh, to some extent effectiveness, as I suppose, with the shift of the war to the east. But there's no, I think, most um, students of Russian military will at this point agree that the Russian military has not been performing well um, and it has showed to itself to be much weaker, much less trained, less developed, less uh, capable than um, what we expected it to be and assessed it to be. And if we're focusing specifically on this conversation of new and emerging technologies, if anything, we have seen a very limited deployment of these capabilities. Uh, to an extent, like we'll talk about why, why that happened, but when I had, you know, my first kind of uh, interviews and conversations on this topic uh, before February, when Russia was uh, concentrating forces on um, the Ukraine border and talk of war was really, you know, being heightened. And I re very specifically remember doing an interview where somebody asked me uh, whether Ukraine's um, arsenal of Turkish drones is going to make any sort of a difference um, protecting against a Russian invasion. And I pretty confidently said no, because Russia has very sophisticated integrated air defenses and electronic warfare capabilities that it can use to prevent such an attack and you know put it out of commission even before it materializes. Well, you know, joke is on me, <laughs> but mostly joke is on Russia, uh, because clearly Ukraine has used those drones quite effectively, and Russia has been very not good, <laughs> let's say it like that, uh, in preventing or defending against those capabilities. And meanwhile, on its own end, uh, we've seen you know, antiquated equipment from the beginning, really terrible logistics and maintenance capabilities, just absolute destruction of 
massive and massively expensive gear by Turkish drones that <laughs> very much don't cost as much. So here, this really brings me to a point that, you know, Michael articulated in the beginning, the issue of how we talk about things versus what they are in reality. And that is on two dimensions. The one and first one here being the difference between reading military doctrine and observing operational reality. Um, to an extent, when I you know, spend a lot of time early on in the war trying to understand uh, why Russia is failing, you know, performing as poorly as it is, and how is it that we kind of miscalculated or misassessed so much of its capabilities, one of the most basic, <laughs> you know, explanations to me seemed that Russia was not only not following its military doctrine, um, it was fighting essentially against its own military doctrine. Everything that it did, it articulated in its military doctrine that it was not going to do. Establish, you know, prep the battlefield, establish information dominance, uh, the robust and integrated air defenses, the focus on targeting command and control, uh, all of these things that Russia supposedly knows how to do because its military plans very clearly outline it were absolutely not manifested in this operational reality. And that, that difference between doctrine and reality also shapes the, our approach and use and, th uh, you know, plans for integrating new technologies. Because once again, you can have a very developed doctrine, uh, but no plan survives, I guess, uh, an encounter with uh, the Ukrainian mud. <laughs> Uh, but beyond that, really just an encounter with this hard, conventional state-to-state uh, -state fighting, state-to-state -state war uh, in a way that, you know, even the United States has not really seen in a very long time. Another parameter here is this important differentiation between innovation and adoption. And this one is on a lot of us, I think, in the policy space and the think tank environment and uh, in the media. Whenever we see something fascinating and shiny and new and sophisticated and interesting, a lot of the discussion goes out the window in terms of trying to very clearly differentiate where in the technology development pipeline this thing is. A lot of what we got about Russian military uh, programs and ideas and, you know, investments in these AI and autonomy related technologies is very much in the concept and R&D stages with a little bit more at the experimentation phase. But again, the road from there to wide scale adoption, let alone to operational deployment is, you know, fraught and full of terrors because it's it, 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 for a variety of reasons, but we have to be very, very clear going forward and, you know, even going backwards in our estimation and reestimation of this space um, to understand what it is, which stage of the technology development uh, cycle um, this uh, technology of interest is um, and what are still the barriers that it's facing uh, before it becomes, um, you know, operational. Uh, another point here that I think is quite vital uh, when we're thinking about the technology competition, who is going to win the AI race, who is going to take it to the next level when it comes to military applications of AI. I think it's really important that we pay attention to the non-technological barriers to the adoption of these emerging technologies. Because in addition to all of the problems that we're seeing with uh, Russian equipment, Russian training, um, Russian ability to perform even basic tactics, a lot of what we're seeing are problems of human capital 
and problems of command and control, which are related to culture. So we talk a lot about, you know, Pentagon bureaucracy and antiquated acquisition and budgeting practices, all of these organizational barriers that are precluding, let's say, the United States from innovating and adopting AI at scale. But I think we really need to hone down on this very specific idea of the human capital, the issues of human machine trust, uh, the issues of human to human trust across the command chain, civil military relations, all of these non-technical and non-technological barriers to the adoption of a technology that is at its core is meant to support and enable human decision-making that is faster, more precise, more conclusive, um, and more confident. So if we don't have a good understanding of these parameters of the human and the human institutions, then we're getting ourselves farther and farther away from understanding what do we need to adopt AI at scale. And for Russia, it's you know this to the nth degree of how severe it is. So, Kind of getting to the end here and thinking about what's ahead for Russia. What are the sanctions doing already? It's been, you know, almost almost half a year of this um, horrific war um, of this extensive sanctions regime that has been, you know, um, employed against Russia in a way that is, you know, people use the word unprecedented uh, quite often without real meaning, but it seems that uh, the sanctions, the, the variety and the unity of them, uh, at least very uh, in the early stages of the war has been quite significant and, and truly, you know, kind of reinvigorated Western leadership, NATO leadership, um, and unity of democracies against authoritarian aggression. So what are the implications? Obviously, the, the Russian commercial technology ecosystem is suffering and is probably going to suffer into the long term. Uh, we hear a lot about brain drain and exodus of uh, skilled labor, especially technologists, IT experts uh, leaving the country. Uh, we're obviously there's going to be a massive hit on any sort of foreign investment, any sort of international collaborative research with companies pulling out of Russia, um, kind of relocating their operations elsewhere, halting operations, um, seizing them completely. Obviously, there's a significant impact. Having said that, I think we shouldn't kind of, we're still not at a point where we can know the full extent of it uh, and not at a point where we can really reliably have any sort of data that is coming out of Russia to say what it's even going to do in the shorter term. Like even on the question of talent, which I fully believe there is a there is a brain drain going on and significant exodus. At the same time, we've seen a lot of people leave very early in the war, but they didn't leave to, the majority of them didn't go to Europe or UK or the United States or Australia, they went to Georgia and Armenia and to Kazakhstan to an extent to wait it out, to wait and see what's going to happen. And we've also seen some data that shows that there's been a decent amount of returnees. So we still don't really fully know the scale of uh, that these sanctions and the decline of the commercial ecosystem has had on, on the talent issue. Um, so I, I would, you know, kind of urge some caution there. And we also know that the Russian government is uh, really trying to uh, retain and emphasize like the retention policies for this tech sector in specific uh, with giving like exemptions for any sort of draft or military service for IT and other tech workers and promises for pay raises and increases and better con living conditions in general. Um, so this one is kind of still one to watch. And the military modernization and innovation angle, like when you're watching uh, the inability, when the utter collapse of Russian armor 
um, the imprecision of Russian artillery uh, and the sinking of one of Russia's, you know, signature, um, you know, warships by <laughs> what appears to be quite rudimentary technology, you really must question yourself, where have these billions and billions of rubles have gone over the last decade that were meant to go to military modernization? Um, and what does this mean going forward? Can we trust that these investments are actually reaching their destination and whether AI and other emerging technologies like autonomy and unmanned systems are going to uh, you know, remain a priority when it seems that Russia still struggles with even the basic, uh, some of the basic systems that it needs, especially given the sanctions that are being loaded on it. Um, with that, there's also, uh, we got to be thinking on the other side of the, you know, the coin is how does Russia moderate some of this impact? Um, and one of the main arguments that's been made is through Russian Chinese technology cooperation. Um, so I'll, I'll double click on this tech cooperation, but then I'll also make the point about other um, non-Western countries, let's say it like that. Um, when we talk about Russian Chinese tech cooperation, this is a bit of a side a side dive because I thought uh, you might be interested to learn uh, to hear more about this topic, and we've done some work on it at CSET, so I thought I'd highlight it. When we talk about Russian Chinese technology collaboration, it's usually along these two parameters. One is the idea that Russia and China are one way or another sort of united in this effort to export digital authoritarianism. So they have different models and different approaches to using digital technologies for things like repression and surveillance and manipulation and information propaganda, both domestically and abroad. So different approaches, but with kind of the same goal of shaping the information environment using technology in a way that is more aligned with authoritarian interests as opposed to the democratic model of, you know, open information environment. And the second area that I think is one that is even more relevant to the discussion of how Russia gets itself out of the hole um, is one that looks into collaboration in emerging technologies between Russia and China, especially since there's been such a presumably massive push, uh, this emphasis of a year of scientific and technical innovation cooperation in areas like biotechnology, artificial intelligence, robotics, and all of these declarations about working together, new high-tech initiatives, research centers, all sorts of cooperative agreements. Uh, the last couple of years have really, you know, we've seen the proliferation of these. That kind of pushed us at CSET to look more closely into what is actually happening in Russian-Chinese collaboration in AI in specific. Uh, and we looked on two parameters of collaboration. One is co-authored papers between Russia and China. And the second one is AI-related investment flows. And to briefly tell you what we saw was very, very limited and very, very minimal. The uh, efforts to work together to publish papers together, in these 10 years, we saw less than 300 joint research papers between Russian and Chinese um, authors. Um, and that is compared to almost 40,000 uh, between US and Chinese authors. Obviously, there's a whole range of reasons for why that is true. But it's still nonetheless notable, given all of this hype and hoopla about Russian Chinese AI corroboration. And the same parameter, the same trends are evident when it comes to investment. Really, really limited flows of money that's related to AI, of funds that are related to AI um, between Russia and China, and especially compared to the massive, massive you know, flows of investments between the United States and China. So what remains true is that Russia and China have not been an import, important scientific partners for one another. And the United States really still remains the top partner and destination for China. And, and Russia um, is not, has not been as nearly as strong. 
Um, meanwhile, Russia itself, especially when it comes to AI research collaboration, has mostly looked to Europe, to partners in Europe. So that relationship, I really want to be a little, you know, careful about assuming what it's going to bring on the one hand, uh, because there's still real concerns and real barriers there um, that are going to preclude some of that collaboration. I have to do with, you know, industrial espionage, IP theft, um, just the nationalism of the defense establishments where they're very eerie of working together with other countries on co-development of tech. And of course, the whole issue of sanctions and US-China relations um, are kind of going to complicate the future of this Russia-China partnership. So I don't really believe that China is going to fully replace the West as the supplier and collaborator for Russia, for, for Russia when it comes to emerging technologies and emerging tech collaboration. Uh, there are some gaps that China can fill and that others are already filling, like the recent deals that we've seen on drone on drone exports from Iran, some of the ongoing agreements uh, Russia has with India, a very interesting and complicated collaboration and relationship with Israel. Those countries will continue to play a role. China will continue to play a role. But there's no argument that Russia is taking a significant hit from the sanctions. The question is, of course, to what extent and whether that is sufficient to drain the Russian war machine to get the war to stop and bring them one way or another to a halt or to the negotiations table. Assuming those, that is the goal of the sanctions, which is, you know, a conversation to be had quite separately even. So let me conclude here. Having gone, you know, over the advances in scientific and commercial uh, progress in AI, there's really no argument that Russia is very much behind the United States and China when it comes to investment, talent, hardware, research, all of these parameters that we judge AI competitiveness on. That said, there's still important and notable developments in areas such as spatial and speech recognition technologies and robotics that one way or another feed into um, Russian government interests, including Russian military interest. And that stems from the fact that AI development in Russia is very much government led. And the defense community, as I mentioned, plays a vital role in guiding it, especially when it comes to areas such as military robotics, electronic warfare, and cyber and information warfare. The war in Ukraine has really showcased a Russian army and military and a Russian military, you know, defense industrial system that was not on par with what we believed um, Russia has achieved uh, and accomplished with its military modernization efforts over the last decades or so. There's these really severe, deep-rooted systematic pathologies that exist in the Russian system, and the sanctions are going to make this worse and are going to inevitably curtail and limit Russia's technology ambitions. But I want to be clear that it would be absolutely premature to sort of close the book on Russian investment in emerging technologies, Russia's ability to compete in AI, and Russia's ability to cause damage with AI or otherwise. Because you still see this reorganization of the domestic economy and efforts at domestic industry adaptation to feed the need for advanced uh, microelectronics and other more sophisticated things that Russia can't access from the West anymore. And the technological ties that you know, Russia maintains with non-Western countries, despite some of the limits that I highlighted in its relationship with China, one way or another is still going to help mitigate some of the effects of the sanctions. And really, while I would say that a lot of my thinking about Russia and emerging technologies and Russia's ability to fight has very much evolved over the last six months, um, one thing that I still maintain and still quite convinced of is that Russia doesn't need to be an AI superpower to cause damage. 
it can still use AI enabled technologies now or in the future in a way that one way or another advance its goals and undermine US and Western interests. So we got to be careful not to, you know, engage in this jumping back and forth between the tendency to overhype the Russian threat, including the Russian military technology threat, to completely disregard it. Because like in everything in life, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Thank you so much. I will stop now. Um, these, this is my contact information. I really hope that this was useful and interesting. And I'm very excited to hear your questions and open to um, a conversation.